Stars are undeniable evidence that evolutionism is bankrupt. The supposed scientists claim that stars formed when clouds of gas in a nebula coalesced due to gravity. Eventually, these bodies became so massive that the atoms at their centers began to fuse hydrogen into helium, creating a star. This is known as the nebular hypothesis of star formation. What evolutionists fail to account for is Boyle's Law, which states that the pressure of a gas increases as it is compressed in a smaller and smaller volume. This force alone alone is more than enough to overpower the force of gravity, which they claim brings the whole thing together. And they expect us to believe that an entire star can form simply from interstellar gas? Somebody isn't thinking this all the way through. I had to investigate. In 1663, Richard Townley published results of experiments he'd conducted with Henry Power showing a roughly inverse relationship between gas pressure and volume. On April 27, 1661, they used an early barometer to measure the pressure of air at different altitudes on Pendle Hill in Lancashire, England. As a result, they recognized a relationship between the density of air and its pressure, but they were not the first to publish their findings. Robert Boyle, having discussed this relationship with Townley, had already published it in 1662 as Mr. Townley's hypothesis. For this paper, his assistant Robert Hooke procured a closed J-shaped tube and after pouring mercury from one side, he forced the air on the other side to contract under the pressure of the mercury. He repeated the experiment several times using different amounts of mercury and discovered that under controlled conditions, the pressure of a gas is inversely proportional to the volume occupied by it. This became known as Boyle's Law and is stated as, the absolute pressure exerted by a given mass of an ideal gas is inversely proportional to the volume it occupies if the temperature and amount of gas remain unchanged within a closed system. In the 1780s, Jacques Charles conducted numerous unpublished experiments in buoyancy which led to the invention of dirigible aircraft. He conducted an experiment where he filled five sites to the same volume with different ads. He then raised the temperature of the sites to 80 degrees Celsius and noticed that they all increased in volume by the same amount. This demonstrated the inverse relationship of temperature to gas pressure, but this relationship wasn't published until 1802 by natural philosopher Joseph Louis Lesac. He did, however, credit it to Charles and named the law in his honor. Charles's law stated as, under constant pressure, an ideal gas's volume is proportional to its absolute temperature. The volume of a gas at constant pressure increases linearly with the absolute temperature of the gas. In 1811, Amadeo Avogadro hypothesized that two given samples of an ideal gas of the same volume and at the same temperature and pressure contain the same number of molecules. Although in time this hypothesis was shown to be inaccurate, it did give a very close and practical approximation of the behavior of ideal gases. Avogadro's law is stated as, equal volumes of all gases at the same temperature and pressure have the same number of molecules. As these three observations were applied, it became obvious that they were describing the very same phenomenon, but from different perspectives. In 1834, Emil Klepiron combined all three into what is known as the ideal gas law, essentially stating that volume, pressure, and temperature in an ideal gas are proportional to each other. It was also derived from the microscopic kinetic theory by August Kronig in 1856 and Rudolf Clausius in 1857. All three laws are good approximations of the behavior of many gases under many conditions conditions, but they have several limitations. The most notable limitation is that all three assume that the gas being measured is composed of many randomly moving point particles whose only interactions are perfectly elastic conditions at standard temperature and pressure, much like a bunch of billiard balls on a table. This is known as an ideal gas, a theoretical gas that doesn't actually exist in the real world. Molecular interactions at the atomic level are not taken into account. These laws also fail at excessively high or low temperatures. For example, at temperatures approaching absolute zero, like much of interstellar space, there is virtually no gas pressure. None of the laws, however, take into account the effect of the electromagnetic force, especially when a gas is ionized. Ionized particles, by definition, have a non-zero electric charge, and thus have a magnetic charge which attracts them to particles of an opposite charge. As particles come closer and closer together, the force of electromagnetism eclipses the force of gravity by up to 39 orders of magnitude, easily overpowering the gas pressure as well. As more and more particles bond, their combined gravity increases. This effect compounds quickly. 
As opposed to just gas, at this level specifically, these laws do not apply to clouds of dust. At this level, the effect of gravity is more than enough to counteract the elasticity of collisions resulting in coalescing. To test these assertions, in 2010, American astronaut Don Pettit set up his own experiment while he was in space using salt, sugar, coffee, and other particulate matter to see how they interacted in a zero-gravity environment. To his surprise, he found that the particles tended to clump together instead of coming apart. This was not due to ionization but simply due to static electricity generated by particle collisions. Ideal gas laws simply did not apply in this situation. Whether using Boyle's law, Charles's law, or Avogadro's law, the ideal gas laws just do not apply to the nebular hypothesis. They describe gas behavior in ideal conditions that are far from universal. The temperatures in space vary in enough extremes that the laws do not function like they do on Earth. The condition at the early universe, as predicted by the Big Bang model, was filled with ionizing radiation. Under these conditions, the electromagnetic force vastly overpowers any gas pressure that may exist. And although it can accumulate in clouds, dust is a solid, not a gas. So whether or not the nebular hypothesis is correct, the ideal gas laws are not a detriment to stellar formation. They are a limited set of laws that predict the behavior of gas under ideal conditions that rarely exist. And another example of how creationism taught me real science. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may become the basis for a future episode. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.